dear Professor Pollock, honorable doctor, audience, the students. It is really my great honor to introduce Grisella Pollock on the occasion of her being awarded the, the degree of uh, Doctor Honoris Causa of our Academy. The ceremony is taking place uh, tomorrow, as you know, and in the Laudatio speech that will be presented at the occasion, you can hear much more of the merits of Griselda Pollock. Today, therefore, I shall be brief in order to spare time for the lecture of Professor Pollock. Griselda Pollock is a professor of social and critical histories of art at the School of Fine Art, History of Art and Cultural Studies at the University of Leeds. She's also the director of the Center of Cultural Analysis, Theory and History at the University where she has worked over 40 years already. Professor Pollock, as you of course know, is a world-renowned art historian and cultural theorist. She's one of the founding figures of the so-called new or critical art history and feminist research in arts. Hence, She has essentially contributed to the renewal of discipline of art history that started in the late 60s and uh, 70s through the century. Her writings on modern and avant-garde art, she has written uh, over 30 books, brought together analysis of gender, social history, post-structuralist ideas, and psychoanalysis, and have offered new models for understanding the position of artworks in the society. This engagement with history on one hand and with contemporary art on the other characterizes Griselda Pollock's academic work and research throughout her career. Today, we have the chance to enjoy her approach firsthand. As the title, uh, as the title of the uh, lecture indicates, from Alain René Van Gogh, 1948, to Julian Schnabel at, at um, Eternity's Gate, uh, 2018, uh, and the question, why we still loving Vincent, 2007. I personally am very intrigued because uh, uh, if you know, I, may, I know that um, Vincent van Gogh has been her favorite, of all was the favorite uh, art, artist uh, over the years, and if I'm not mistaken, she defended her thesis about Vincent van Gogh uh, years ago. So today we will, I hope, uh, listen to her approach, uh, how Vincent van Gogh is uh, interpreted in uh, different media. Uh, please, so please join me in welcoming Vincent van Gogh. Thank you so very much. Can everybody hear me? Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, thank you, Krista, for this wonderful introduction. And I am delighted to be here as ever. Estonia is one of my uh, homes from home for various reasons because I've been here several times. I can find my way around the old city. Not much else, but at least I know that. And I know where to go and get a nice meal. So this means I definitely feel I've arrived. But I have to have some glasses. One second. Okay. <laughs> Old age. I don't know where I left my glasses as a story. Okay. Um, so I want to, to say two things. One is that uh, uh, rather than Van Gogh being my favorite artist, I am writing a book at the moment called The Case Against Van Gogh, which imagine makes me extremely popular with publishers who thinks nobody's ever going to read a book like that. So this is in fact a, a, a continuing story that since 1980 I have struggled to deliver my vision of uh, how we might read Vincent van Gogh and have failed. So it's a little story of failure. But first I must thank you very much uh, for the honor that this institute is going to confer on me tomorrow to be an honorary graduand having not had to go through any of the stress of exams or work or <laughs> exhibitions or tests. It's just so simple, you get one. But um, I want to tell you a little story because 
Um, I was born uh, here in South Africa, and when I was about six or seven, um, I took a ship, but I also took one of these very ancient planes. So this is before the jet engine, so you can imagine how long it took to get up Africa. And I ended up going to live in Canada. And I went to live in Quebec City, which looks a bit like Tallinn, I thought, when I put it up. You'll recognize a lovely old city on the water, defended with the great Chateau de Frontenac at the top, and lovely old streets. So I thought you'd feel like at home if I mentioned that. But it was in Quebec. But because I am not Catholic and I was not French-speaking, I went to a school with every single other non-Catholic, non-French-speaking person. We were all bundled together as the aliens. And there I met various people, mostly political refugees, fleeing different kinds of conflicts from Cuba, some from various parts of Asia, some from um, Hong Kong. And there I met a girl from Estonia. So I thought, where on earth is this new country? It was not a map, a picture on the map, because of course, there really wasn't Estonia. This is in the uh, 1950s. You had disappeared into the map of another neighboring country. Um, but I remember being so intrigued by this. So whenever people say, oh, they're Estonia, I know where Estonia is. I know about it because of my friend. And I realized, of course, as I got older, what it meant to have had a history that had been disappeared into that map. And you will recognize your dear Professor Katrin Kivimar, Rebecca Polstam, various people who have helped me to understand more about that history, and indeed Krista as well, about what it is to have lived through that history, what it is to live now, what it is to look back. But also in the presence of someone like Katrin who came through the Central European University that was created to enable intellectuals from the former Eastern Europe that had been deprived of access to a certain kind of free intellectual life, that university for a moment provided a whole forum, and it was there I met Katrine who came then to Leeds, and of course with Leeds she opened my world to your world by virtue of the fact I had to quickly learn enough to be able to supervise somebody working on the history of the early, late 19th century rise of national identity right the way through to the 1920s and the 1990s. Um, I also, through that connection, learnt, as I said before when I was here, in, to understand that Western European intellectuals had kind of forgotten that there was a Central and Eastern European intellectual world and history, and it was my obligation, just as it was for me to know about artists from Africa, from the subcontinent, from the rest of the world, and not merely just white Americans or, or, or Western Europeans, it was my obligation to expand my world. And so through uh, working with Raluca Bibiri, who was a Romanian feminist working in Bucharest, and through the uh, uh, two people, Tomasz Kętlinski and Paweł Leskowicz, uh, who uh, really took me into the world of Poland and Polish art, through which I became uh, interested in Alina Szepochnikow and various other artists of that particular area, but also I currently have a young PhD student working with me. I wanted to introduce Asel Kadir, Kadir Kanova, who is from Kazakhstan, and she's working on post-Soviet cultural memory and what happens, particularly in the case of her country, with the trauma of a famine, and a Stalinist imposed created famine, famine in which, which 1.3 million people died. And this piece of work is part of her um, exploration of the post-Soviet world. It's a typewriter and every single image on the wall is effectively a death warrant that was, as it were, typed by a particular bureaucrat, which makes this rather beautiful piece all done with single threads through the typewriter. So my sense of uh, where I am and why I'm here uh, is uh, one of great joy and pleasure to have had the opportunity to come and lecture in Estonia several times and to be connected with your intellectual and cultural community, but now particularly to be connected with your academy in all its richness. I teach in a department of fine art, history of art and cultural studies, which like yours is a kind of unique conversation and now you're all in one building. It's also a very important sense of how these conversations work. Um, my work has so much in the last couple of years been concerned with trauma and cultural memory, which again I think relates to what we are thinking about here. And at the same time, as Krista said, I am deeply involved in questions of contemporary art, mostly through the prism of these three terms, critical thinking, critical art making, critical curating, 
and I'm working on a book about Documenta since 1989, another sign of the encounter with the question of why these dates matter in the transformation of the world, end of the Cold War, but the end of a, a, a whole era of the division of Europe. So thank you for the invitation. And now you're probably asking yourself, why did I choose to talk about Van Gogh on this wonderful occasion of being honored by your academy? And why did I uh, set it up in terms of a French film from 1948, and then two very recent films, quite different in way, one a feature length film, The Eter At Eternity's Gate by an ex-artist, and one an extraordinary exercise that some of you, if you're working in animation and design, might be fascinated as an exercise in the uses of technology in conversation with art. Now, in my blurb, um, I'm, I'm not going to read my paper, I'm just going to be prompted from time to time in case I forget something anywhere interesting on the way. Um, in my blurb, I uh, introduced a bit of autobiography. I said, I mentioned that I uh, had had this first encounter with the work of Vincent van Gogh, I think, in 1961, just after I had moved to Canada, and I'd left Quebec, and I went to English-speaking Toronto. And I wondered if my first exposure to van Gogh when I was 12, year old, 12 years old was my initiating art historical trauma, a trauma not that turned me off art history, but obliged me to spend the rest of my life, once I got round to it, actually working on the problem of art history, and at the core of it was, for me, the problem of Vincent van Gogh. Now, why would I call this memory a trauma? It's because I didn't remember it for many, many years. In fact, I only remembered that I had been to this exhibition in 1990 when I was at a conference marking the, the 100th anniversary of his death. Now, normally, we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of somebody who initiates something to the world, but you've already got a clue there. The clue to the trauma of Fahoch is that we are only interested in his being dead, especially if he killed himself, and you'll see how often this issue of death comes up. So um, for that paper in 1990, I prepared a, a, a conference, uh, a presentation, which I'm going to talk about, but just to give you a quick map of where I'm going to go, I'm going to jump about from 61 to 69, back to 47, 53, 55, 2017. So if you get chronologically confused, maybe just try and remember that there is a purpose in this, and you'll see how they link up. Um, I'm going to talk about a film by this French, maker, French filmmaker, Alain René, called The Roch, which was made in 1948. And as has already been mentioned, uh, Vincent de Roch was the topic of my PhD, which you see here, which is, um, was never supervised properly, so it was 200,000 words, when it's only meant to be 100,000 words. And my supervisor only read 100,000, because the pencil marks correcting my spelling stopped, because this is typescript. So I knew he'd given me a PhD on half of what work I'd done, but nobody would ever publish this book. Who wants to know what you have to say? Who wants to understand this? It's just too much too critical. But I did persist, and my first book was one of these books called, uh, this book called Vincent van Gogh. Uh, Fred and I wanted to call it Rooted in the Earth, Earth a Van Gogh primer, wouldn't sell has to be called artist of his time, as if this is saying anything. When, how can you be an artist of anybody else's time? <laughs> kind of logical. Um, I did do a curating exhibition, Vincent van Gogh in St. Hollandse Jahren, Kekop Stadtenland, and so forth and so on in Dutch. But as you can see, it is in Dutch, so it's unlikely you're going to read it. And then uh, in a book that absolutely never sold, because people couldn't get the title, couldn't understand what we meant, uh, you have to be American to know about Partisan Review as the kind of key um, journal of critical writing at a certain point, uh, in which there's a great deal that I've written about struggling with Van Gogh and struggling with the 19th century. I just show you this to show how serious and obsessive this struggle is, because this is all my articles that relate to Vincent Van Gogh in different ways. Okay? But... What I did for the 1990 conference was to trace the history of the exhibitions by which Vincent van Gogh became Vincent for some or van Gogh for others. Now this is the thing, why he called himself Vincent is in Dutch you have a guttural G. So some of you will have studied Peter de Hoog and 
that is more or less the same. Vachoch, Baruch is the same name. But he was going to be kind, so he thought, why not pretend to be Rembrandt and call yourself by your first name? So that's why he was signed his paintings Vincent, as Rembrandt did. But now the Americans call Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, everything. So I'm practicing my gutturals over here. Anyway, one of the key moments for the emergence of Fachoch into uh, the Anglophone world is in 1910, when there was a show at called um, Manet in the Post-Impressionist, curated by a man called Roger Fry. Roger Fry had been a connoisseur working on Mantegna. He was the editor of the big connoisseurial journal, but he suddenly got modernism, particularly through encountering the work of Cézanne. And he was the one who brought certain artists to London very early. Now, this is long before 1929, when Alfred Barr would bring the same group of artists to New York and initiate the Museum of Modern Art with that exhibition. Uh, and Van Gogh was included with Manet, Cézanne, Gauguin, and Matisse. Interestingly, who is not there? Sura is not there. Um, and then in 1927, Roger Fry saw an exhibition of Van in London and decided that he had been mistaken in his assessment. He concluded, I hope this is going to be this one, yes, he's going to include, anyone who has read Van Gogh's letters will have felt here a personality more beautiful and interesting than anything it accomplished. For Fahoch was not primarily an artist. This magisterial but shocking and heretical verdict by the arch formalist critic Roger Fry was declared after seeing Fahoch's paintings. Between the moment which falls at the end of the first phase, the critical and artistic responses to Van Gogh, which led to largely take up in Germany, um, and the moment that I'm going to be studying, we go along, we have to see this complex indifference to Vincent van Gogh expressed by the keepers of culture and the rise outside the world of elite knowledge of a popular concept and understanding. So it was not innate artistic value but cultural politics that created van Gogh and made the red-haired Dutch amateur painter into a mythic image of the modern artist in the 20th century. There's no doubt that this artist is more widely known on this planet, in almost every culture, in every language, than any other. It has, it's in the light of the paradox that he is the modernist artist who represents modernism, even though he was not a modernist artist at all. The paradox of notoriety and mythicization that obscures and discourages any historical or analytical work. So that's the kind of artist against whom I'm trying to make this case. Now, what did Fry have to say? Fry acknowledged Van Gogh's blatant anarchism in art had offered the most overpowering possibilities and the revelation of possibilities of what you could do with color and what you could do in the manner of putting paint on, which people who were properly trained as artists subsequently saw and used. If you compare a Fahok to a Derain, you will see how an artist with as a real colorist understood what could become possible because of his extraordinary behavior, as it were, but it's not the same as understanding that Fahok understood what he was doing with color. Van Gogh became installed in a pantheon of founding modernists, as I said, by 1929, but writing in 1923, Fry wanted to uh, argue something different. He said, that the effects of his paintings had been made by an untrained amateur only as the result of the sheer force of character that compelled him to use art because other avenues of expression had been blocked. Quote, he never seems to be learning his art. He works as a child who's never been taught, works with a feverish haste to get the image which obsesses him externalized in paint. And for this Fry, um, for Fry, this unconsidered impulsive haste is precisely the sign of the non-painter. I quote. Let's get this one. Right. one could see that he must always have had worked at high pressure and with the utmost speed. Van Gogh has no time and no need for that slow process. Now he's clearly got Cezanne in mind. Cezanne is the opposite of Van Gogh. The man who spent an in lifetime looking at one mountain or two apples 
right, or one statuette, and asking himself the question which, for which we revere by Cezanne, which is, what is it to see anything in the world and find any way that painting can join or meet the impossible? So the slow, repeated, persistent, dedicated work of Cezanne remains a resource for all of us when we look at his work, but Van Gogh has no time and no need for that slow process of gradually perfecting an idea and bringing out it in all of its possibilities. He was too much convinced at the moment ever to doubt. He was too little concerned with the fate of his work himself to mind whether it was complete or not, so long as he had somehow got the essential stuff of his idea on canvas. This is not the way of the greatest masters, but it was the only way for Van Gogh. And so the fiery intensity of his conviction gave certainty and rhythm to his untrained hand. Now, I'm pretty sure that if you have been studying art history or picked up a book at any point in your turn to art or involvement with art, you will not have read texts like that. You will not have been told by very distinguished scholars that this really is an autodidact painter, an amateur with no grasp of the essential issues of modernism that we would try to drum into your head so you could understand what happened after Cézanne. Fry acknowledged for Hawker's original colorist, but he found the artist's heightened <coughs> sensitivity to colors elemental and childlike and capable of seizing complex inter interrelations and correspondences of such profoundly mediated color structures as you find built up in Cézanne and others. He had no understanding of artistic form, volume, and construction in depth. He relied on heavy outlines of whole contours to hold any shape in place. He had no awareness of the role of light in painting, the subtle uses of color to induce effects of luminosity. Shock and daring, yes, but he lacked any understanding of tone or harmony or understanding of how color, qua color, might function as its replacement. For Fry, therefore, Van Gogh was art historically interesting, if not curious, even immediately inspiring in radically breaching the limits that other more astute, classically trained, or aesthetically gifted artists might explore with more sustained results. So there can be no doubt about the impact of those paintings after him, but we have to suspend the notion that he was part of it. And this is why the end of my first quotation was, he was not an artist. Van Gogh ends, as one might have guessed, from his temperament, as he must end, as an inspired illustrator. Now, anybody here who's working in illustration, do not take immediate offense, please, because we have transformed our understanding of that, of the graphic arts completely, but for Fry, this was his judgment. Now, if we have to think, if that is what is said in the 1920s, how come by the beginning of the 1930s and by 1936, we will find a phenomenal change in Van Gogh's status in the world? And that comes about when the director of the Museum of Modern Art, Alfred H. Barr, finds that because of the depression, the owners of one of the largest collections of Van Gogh work, Mrs. Krollemuller, has no longer any money to house the paintings. So they're all going to be packed up and put in storage. So Barr manages to raise a very small amount of money and says, for $5,000, can I just whip your collection over to New York? Which he does. Now, this is a phenomenon. For Hoch's work is in two major collections. That of his nephew, the engineer, Vincent Van Gogh, which is now the Van Gogh Museum, and the Krollemullers. There's about, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 paintings out of that, but you have two collections, you just have to go to one or other, and you've got the full range. Very easy to select, any of you curators, just take them So this show arrives in New York and is spectacularly successful. But what is interesting is that when Barr recommends it to his advisory board, distinguished curators, art lovers, and the kind of collectors, they say, don't do it. This is going to be, this is a bad show, we don't need, and these are the resolutions. The Van Gogh show should be abandoned because one, 
Van Gogh was well represented at the first museum show in 29. You've seen that. Two, he died 45 years ago and his influence on contemporary painting has waned. That's an interesting thing to follow up. Three, there is much similarity of impulse behind Fahol's paintings that a one-man show would prove less interesting than can now be imagined. Now, this is a very crucial point because it is actually accurate. If you go to most of the big shows that we do, big monographic paintings, shows of Cezanne or whatever, even it's been a lovely Lee Krasner one in London, the benefit of a monographic show is that you can watch somebody making decisions. You can see how a certain set of problems opposed to them, they think their way through, they think their way out, they run up against a brick wall, they abandon something, they see something else happening that they have to take on. You can track an artist's mind working its way through both an internal problem and a series of intersections. And it's interesting. And then, of course, you get to the end and there's the decline and you feel embarrassed, like the Kooning show, when they show only the works of a man repeating himself as he suffered from his uh, Alzheimer's. But with Vincent Verhoff, you can't. You can't track, because one painting one day will be doing something, one the next day will do something else. There isn't that sense of what the project is that keeps going um, on the basis of, of the track. So I thought they, that's an interesting point that they made. So you have to ask yourself, what is it that is going to sustain the endless repetition of shows of Verhoff, which are largely chronological. Number four, the museum is much criticized for not being up to date and the Verhoff show would be increased such a criticism. It's really out of date now, and then it would be excessively expensive. Now, they go ahead with the show. They have good reasons. They go ahead with the show. Um, and then we find an interesting comment by a man who will emerge as one of the key articulators of uh, an account of American art in the 1950s, that he's a Marxist critic, writing in 36, reviewing the show, he says, Van Gogh is both overrated and undervalued. The mysticism of color and the indiscriminate violence of the manner cooperate at the expense of everything in the art of painting, that does not pertain to a language of personal sentiment. Okay, he, at the expense of everything in painting that is not about personal sentiment. I, everything that, as artists or as art historians, we would be interested in what makes this work. Yet the works, um, these works of painting, um, these works define the artist, and it is in these qualities that the structural defects of Hoch's masterpieces the inconsequentiality of the composition, the lack of plastic differentiation, are, when not overlooked entirely, attributed customarily to a temperamental necessity without which his forms would be inconceivable. Now, we've seen this notion in both Freinau and Rosenberg, but the key element that is going to occur is that these paintings, precisely because the Art historians and artists and art critics don't like them for their lack of uh, structure and all this it becomes the very reason that the public does. And one of the great arguments that I am discerned in trying to work out why the Fahok show was so popular in 1936 is it took place in the Depression. It took place after one of the worst crises that Western capitalism had endured. It took place in a catastrophic destruction of the economic well-being, the livelihoods, and in many cases, the lives of vast numbers of Americans. Okay, Roosevelt's New Deal was beginning to kick in by the time he starts his second term of office. But as we know from our art history studies, most of the artists are starving, but the Works Progress Administration will finally provide a sort of safety net for them. But if one imagines going to a Fahok exhibition in the 1930s in that context and seeing some of his paintings of the potato eaters and perhaps already, not quite, seeing some of Dorothea Lang and the other American photographers' studies of the people who had been reduced to famine in Oklahoma and in the what's called the 
the, the Dust Bowl when the whole of the central agricultural area of the United States suffered a devastating turn to drought and people were driven off their land. You can imagine a reciprocation. And I'm not alone in thinking this because we find that Russell Lines, one of the great critics at the, of the history of the uh, Museum of Modern Art, will write, it was as though in the depths of the Depression, as those days were called, a bright and cheerful light had been let in. No matter that it came from somewhere, somewhat dark soul and an often deranged mind, wasn't everybody's soul feeling somewhat dark and his mind somewhat deranged back then? Or so some people said, or felt like saying. So what we're going to witness in the 1930s is this disdain from the elite culture with regard to the significance of Vincent van Gogh's work but a number of factors which will collaborate to, cons to kind of configure around the formation of what becomes what I call the myth of Hoho. The first is the res responses of people to the desolation, and therefore they absorb both parts of Hoho's work, the desolation of the potato eaters, but also the exhilaration of the escape from this dark, phonic world into the, the sort of sun, into the mythic sense of his sort of solar ecstatic universe. The other is that this is the first publication, collected publication in English of his letters, so this will impact in America. And Barr, as a curator, placed quotations from the letters next to each painting, beginning to give us, in a sense, the presence of the artist providing the direct alibi or explanation for the impulse behind each of the works. And also, the first English language Biography, I mean, the first biography of, of Frau Hoch is written by Julius Meyergräfer uh, in German, in Germany, who calls it the sort of the biography of a soul seeking man. A, another story for another time, the German reception of Frau Hoch. But here, Lust for Life, the novel by Irving Stoll, Stone, will appear. And in the reviews of this exhibition, the critics comment on the way in which the audience for this show has been hyped up. Bloomingdale's, the great department store, has a sunflowers window. The first notion of the kind of branding and, and hype that we now know becomes every part of every show you go to. You can get your Rothko scarf, you can get your Jackson Pollock, I don't know, whatever, you know, baking bowl or whatever you want. All of these things become part and parcel of every exhibition we go to is the merchandising that goes with it. This was the first occasion of this kind of hype. And secondly, that the Lust for Life had got out to um, the popular world. And so uh, the cult critics talk about how the audience comes from the readers of the Ladies' Home Journal. Now, here is a nice little twist, because they always anticipate increasingly now, and in the next few exhibitions I'm going to talk about, that the audience is, if not all women, is mentally feminized sensitized to suffering, full of sympathy for this poor fellow. Okay, so the 1936 uh, MoMA exhibition exhibits a passage of Vincent van Gogh from limited elite artistic knowledge where he's undervalued to a public sphere of entertainment where he becomes a sensation fueled by the nature of, as it were, the cultural anxieties of the time. And the letters provide a biographical key so instead of an artistic key, right, we are going to be in the realm in which the letters and biography will give him, um, give a logic to what you're going to watch. So once you map the paintings onto a life, right, life is going to have a beginning, early years, middle years, development, it will have a death, of course. But we'll see what kind of death. So it's in this context I finally get to the first film of my lecture, which is the second major cluster of Van Gogh exhibitions are created using the other collection, the Vincent van Gogh family collection, because the Netherlands had been liberated from German occupation by the Canadians and the Americans and the British, the Allies. And so as a thank you, for the liberation of the Netherlands. They couldn't send Rembrandts aboard because all the great Rembrandts are in Russia, in the Hermitage. Okay? But they have these huge collections of Van Gogh. So from 1947 onwards, 
almost every, not quite state of the Union of the United States, but most countries in Europe and in far as Tokyo and Seoul get a Van Gogh exhibition. And one of them is in Paris in 1947. Um, and he is going to be, therefore, um, the object of the one of the first films that Alain René makes. Now, you may not know a lot about Alain René, but Alain René is nobody in the 1940s. He's just come out of art school or his education, and he's trying to make a living. And the way he makes a living is making very short films about artists. That's his first ex so he's formulating a whole new film form, which is the essay film, which is what we call it now, but with, with, in terms of artists. And he goes to, um, if you see here, this is the list. This is a list of Van Gogh exhibitions. Now, is this the right one? Yes, there it is. Montreal, this is my exhibition, 1961, but then, I'm sorry, that, I'm you the wrong list here. Um, um, I'm sorry, that's, that's what, he goes to this one. Okay, now. I'm going to um, just show you some of it, um, which requires a small technical uh, escape. Okay. Um, now, did I have it here? Is this the one? No, this is the one. This is this. Okay. Now, this says this film attempts to retrace uniquely with the aid of his. Is that actually working? I'd better make it work. Um, it is. That's right. If this is silent at this point. It tends to retrace, with the help of his works, the life and the spiritual adventure of one of the greatest painters of modern times. The genie and importance of Vincent van Gogh is today universally rec recognized. However, van Gogh had to fight and work desperately in poverty and at the middle of an almost general or universal indifference in order to att uh, attain, uh, by means of his painting, the absolute which he envisaged. <coughs> you to notice is the close-up of the surface. commissioning of a certain kind of uh, contemporary semi-electronic, definitely discord modernist music by Jean-Jacques Bess. <laughs> a letter to his brother. It seems, what is it? Il me semble toujours être. I always seem to be kind of a, 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 a traveler who goes somewhere um, and to go somewhere into a destination. So again, a teleology is being introduced. Now, the film is only in French, and I haven't done a kind of um, undoing. December 1880. Okay, but you're going to have a voiceover. Never represented, nobody ever stands, there's no speaking head, there's no authority. And what we're going to see, and I'm going to, if I do it silently, you can just run while I'm talking, you will see that it's an extraordinary thing to imagine making a film about Vincent van Gogh in black and white. Right? And it's never going to go into colour. It's not as if we're going to have this sort of darkness of the early work and this. Is. But it will ultimately take us on this journey through the desolation, through the isolation, through the misery, through the struggle with the great city, through the escape to the south, through his engagement with people, through his time in the asylum, through his, let's just see if it's going to come to this one, this copy he makes of Gustave Doré's image, um, and it will end up with him And I, 
I'm putting the scene aside because I want you to look at the pans and the tilts, the way in which it's filming a, uh, a photograph, I mean, f filming the, the image as if you are able to tra travel around it. becomes the sort of scene of his imprisonment. a rather vertiginous um, encounter with that um, film which you can watch I think there is one on on, on YouTube um, that you can you can watch is that it is taking you through to the death and as you could see that final kind of pan takes you across the crows over the wheat fields and then another of these periods and then darkness eats slowly eats the painting, he, he is taken into death. So, not too vicious, but of course this is putting in place this painting as the last painting, and I would like to count up the number of times I've been to an exhibition or opened a book and this is the last painting. Now, I have to tell you this is not the case. Vincent van Gogh apparently was wounded, was wounded on the 27th of July in a part of France at which point there is no corn or wheat standing in the field. Right? You can visit any part of France in the early part of the first, first two weeks of July, boom, it's all done, right? Because it's a nice hot country. And it's... Secondly, um, crows do not have anything to do with wheat fields because a bird going near a wheat field would get its wings entangled in the heads. Right? So a little bit of social history research is incredibly helpful in checking out the impossibility of this scene. Secondly, good art history is going to tell you that Crows of the Wheatfields was made, painted in early July 19, uh, 1890 as a series of very interesting experiments in decorative painting that he was developing at the time on double square canvases. So using two canvases or double square in, in proportions, a very unusual, not your typical landscape form, uh, which included the house of Daubigny on the top. Uh, he loved wheat fields. There they are all stacked up, early July, you see, ready. Okay. Um, here you can see they've already been, even some of them in hope. Sometimes it rains and you can't do it. And here is a storm brewing. Another kind of bit of a storm, but we don't know why there are crows there, except perhaps because Vincent van Gogh actually lived in other paintings. He had been an art dealer, his whole world had been shaped in the French Barbizon school, the French 19th century painting. Here are the model for the double square canvases that said Charles Daubigny. Surprise, he lives in Auvergne. This is a little homage to Daubigny we have here. And of course, in the winter, you might see crows landing on the trees, as you see here. Here is 
uh, Daubigny's spring, and so the idea of the seasons is part of this. It also goes back to the 17th century, which is one of the Van Gogh's fam you know, most uh, reverenced part of that. You have uh, de Con Van Hoyen and de Koning, the beginnings of the panoramic landscape, which he's also studying and aware of. It was taken up in the early 19th century by Georges Michel, a now a little known French painter of the beginning of the 19th century, but absolutely fascinating to Vincent van Gogh because of his facture, the, e the, the sort of the freeing up. And I did a little bit of research into this, and here you can see that's where you see crows, because they land after the harvest has gone through because they either get little bits of grain or they get the worms that are coming up because the harvest, the grains. Okay? So there's something here in terms of the way in which we have envisaged the end of Vahok, and you'll see this is important if I get there, which is, this is probably one of the last paintings, cottages. He also painted a church, and these are memories of the north. These are a re-engagement with the sites and forms of his rural uh, Brabant childhood, um, and you can relate, um, this is a Dutch peasant woman that has been placed in a French uh, um, Now, taking that into account and seeing how René's film, why did René's film produce the image not of this um, beautiful decorative scheme of art and this sense of memory of place, it's because one of the responses to the 1947 show was a work by Antonin Artaud, who became the great theatre writer and artist, the founder of the Theatre of Cruelty, and he was objecting to a book that had been written to say that he was a degenerate psychotic. This meant on Du Damon de Van Gogh was a book against which Artaud wrote to say um, that uh, Van Gogh was not mad, Artaud proclaimed, in a text that was written in reaction against this book, because Artaud had himself been in the asylum, and his argument was that society had killed Fachon. <coughs> La société a le, le, le suicide. He was the suicided. He had been suicided by society. So it was a critique of the devastation created by a society that failed to love Fahok. So now we get a, a more political analysis of why the death of Fahok came about. The isolated, the man driven into isolation and solitariness. Um, and I'm going to move on to this a bit further. Okay. Now, this requires a little bit of agility on my part and your part because I need to do two more films about René to get you into a slightly different frame of mind because I've now introduced the idea of not just a cultural reading around the depression or the post-war sort of anguish that was celebrated when, in fact, when people were able to see Van Gogh's paintings, but in a sense, what is the politics of René? And the politics of René is he is an extremely left-wing filmmaker. He is the part, part of the uh, major intellectual um, uh, what's the word? alliance against colonialism, and in 1953 he makes a film with Chris Marker, the man who's going to become one of the most famous figures for the essay film, called Les Statues Meurent Aussi. I won't have time to show it to you, but I do ask you to look it up, although I could possibly show you some. But it's another masterpiece of a uh, cinematic exploration of um, uh, art, including music and with a text worth studying. Um, I think here is the, the reference point. And the argument is that colonialism can kill a culture. African culture is presented as a culture which has a deep and profound spiritual and aesthetic uh, symbolic universe which gives rise to the nature of the forms. And by not filming the objects that now are in anthropological museums and collections in Paris, but by giving them through the drama of filming a sense of their power as images, um, he, uh, Marquer and René are, were able to condemn colonialism for having eviscerated the cultures that uh, Europe um, uh, colonized and reduced its one-time artists to being craftsmen, being directed by colonial masters to make trinkets and tourist objects for the European markets. 
For this film, René was banned by the French government from ever making films again. Right? He had no chance of making a film until in 1955 he was approached because of his political reputation to make the most important film that was made in France um, uh, about the, um, not about the Holocaust, not about the genocide of the Roma and Jewish people of Europe, but about what I call the concentration universe. The concentration universe. So I need to stop you there for a minute. Most of us, when we say the Holocaust or the Second World War, fold genocidal destruction into the operations of the totalitarian system. Now, I don't need to mention this to anybody in the country who has lived with the Soviet Union. Totalitarianism eviscerates its own societies. It eviscerates the possibility of being political subjects because totalitarianism seeks total domination. And for total domination, it must remove from people the characteristics that are the characteristics of free subjects. Plurality, spontaneity, and the possibility of doing something new, of moral action. So, um, this film is a concentrationary film, and I just want to show you the opening. Okay. There is Van Gogh. The opening of that film is one of the most fascinating. It took us, we, I did a project which took 18 months. We studied this film almost frame by frame. But those two, the tilt and the pan, take us from the ordinary everyday world, peasants, fields, harvests, and just by a movement you realize you're already inside a camp. Right? The everyday and the horror of the camp are that close. You can see through the barbed wire. You just move in those two movements from seeing here on my outside and then I'm in the camp, here on my outside and then we cross. Each time we have that movement and they're saying any of these ordinary places can lead to a concentration camp. There were over 10,000 concentration camps in Germany. And more, of course, in every occupied country, just as there were gulags all over the Soviet Empire. The concentration camp is an instrument of the political evisceration and domination of t in totalitarian societies. Everybody knows that they're there. Everybody is aware that the fate to be sent to one is the instrument and horror Okay, and so in work that I've been doing about this on this is, is the idea that René's film is part of a group of people who wanted to produce not a memory that is mourning for what had been lost, but a vigilant memory to remind you that the plague of the concentrationary did not lie dead under the crematoria of Auschwitz or behind these now abandoned wires. It was present because it was present and it was present because it was present within capitalism as much as it was present in totalitarianism. Too complicated an argument to, to lay out, but I give you a series of, of wonderful books that you can read. An entire series of books on the concentrationary cinema of Alain René, concentrationary memories, what it is to create this anxiety about what is happening, how it has penetrated the concentration need to be normalized in the violence of popular culture, and what would it be to make a concentrationary art, not cinema, but this is including contemporary art as work as well as music. So the concentrationary universe was part of the literature out of which the René film came as something that was uh, 
proximate and um, David Rousseau, who wrote, wrote an account of what it, what, what he, a political analysis of what he saw the concentration camp system to be, became one of the most important advocates for the end of all concentration camps, South Africa as a country and the gulags of the Soviet Union. So this is taken up in, in contemporary art. This is uh, William Kentridge and Jane Taylor making up, taking up, uh, but I'll leave it there for a moment, etc. Okay. Now, it is therefore interesting that this question of introducing the Van Gogh, the meadow, the corbeau, the crows, and even when this is translated in German, Ceylon, make sure you understand these are Van Gogh's crows. He calls them Raben. Um, so the politics of this leads us finally to the new films. I told you 1969. This is the moment at which I first remember seeing a Van Gogh exhibition, which was in the Hayward Gallery, which was the first show of Van Gogh since 1947. And it was curated using the engineer's collection. Now, can you imagine a little booklet? It's about like that black and white booklet, no color, typical in the ghastly Eric. But in that exhibition, I do remember the trauma of being led inexorably through the exhibition to the point at which I would meet the crows over the wheat field and confront the site, apparently, of Van Gogh's suicide. Now, it is important to understand that we take this for granted, but actually this is a sacrificial journey. This is almost like going through a kind of living choreography of a certain Christological story because it ends with a sacrifice. And this sacrifice is necessary for us to have the art. This is the price we pay. And I remember being deeply struck by this movement from the thonic world to the ecstatic world and then to that world. And only one painting can do that, can serve that story. And for that reason, art history has to be abandoned because it has to be that story. Okay, we've certainly seen this. Now, as a result of this, when I began to work as a feminist, I realized that until I could undo a certain kind of mythic notion of the artist, I would never be able to understand why the terms woman and artist had become so radically severed that by the late 20th century we had to have a project to recover what was always known. Let me just remind you about women artists. You do not have to find them. They are there. You do just basic art history. Tima Becker, I don't know if you use the German language. I could just look up Tima Becker, one of the great documents of you know, indexes or, or what's the word? dictionaries of artists, every single one I ever wanted to know about was there. I couldn't, we couldn't write the books we write now about artists or women if they weren't in the archives, if there weren't documentation, if they didn't exist. But by the 20th, late 20th century, it had been severed. And how had it been severed? And what role did the mythologization of Van Gogh play in creating a particular configuration of gender, of death, of creativity, of outsiderness that could not be articulated with femininity. So my interest in, in this took up to Lust for Life. And you can see the Christological here. This is the last scene in Lust for Life where in the crow in the field he stands there with a tree and says, I can't go on, right? And shoots himself. But Benelli is a very interesting filmmaker because he's working in the 1950s. And Minelli is pro-modern. In the 1950s, that's quite important in the United States because to be pro-modern is to be not nationalist. American culture is divided in the 1950s between a Trump-like stay-at-home America first policy of art that looks like American and a horror of all this Jewish European modernist stuff, which is considered un-American. So any of you who study the 1950s in America, you know this is one of the great things. McCarthy is fiercely protecting the notion of American culture, and the Museum of Modern Art has to become a major ambassador to say that modern art is not communistic, it is identical with American freedom. 
but it takes quite serious amount. Now, Minelli is on the side of the modernists, and so he makes a film which is a brilliant destruction of Van Gogh, even though it appears to be the most sort of celebrated film, etc., in which he sets the wonderfully abstract, intellectual, and serious, and manly Gauguin against the feminized, creepy, scrunched up, you know, horrifying figure of Kirk Douglas's Van Gogh, who is literally disintegrating before your eyes, and here unraveling before the mirror, before he literally, effectively, symbolically castrates himself. Van Gogh is definitely the manly man, there's a good man spread for you, okay? And Van Gogh is always shown creepily, sneaking up and physically disintegrating. So there's no doubt on which side Minelli was in terms of casting Vincent van Gogh. But it's in the light of that, I'm going to finish quickly because we started a bit late, with um, coming back to, to these two films that I have, have come out recently. Loving Vincent, which is a fascinating film for technology. It's actors who look like the characters in his painting are filmed against a green screen. Then the paintings are projected behind them, and then the uh, hundreds of artists animate each of 65,000 frames for the movement of the actors against this screen. Now, this has three very interesting things. It means that the hundred painters who had to paint the backgrounds and the images can paint a Van Gogh. They are so easy to copy, right? Try doing that to a Cezanne. Pollock, Jackson Pollock, that's what I want. Animated Jackson Pollock for me, okay? But all you have to do is to have to... Okay, now, right? So then they treat all the people in his paintings as if they are characters who could just be brought to life and, lit and meet and talk. So the plot of this film is that this young man, Armand Roulin, who is actually based on a house painting, The Merry Drinker, comes to life and has to deliver a letter and in, they have from Arles and he goes to Paris. He discovers, of course, that not only is Vincent dead, but Theo van Gogh is dead, so he has to go to Auvers and he begins an investigation. So it becomes a detective movie. It's a cold case. Now, do you have cold case movies? You know what I mean by a cold case TV, so it's not a police procedure, it's cold case. So cold case, you go there and you keep asking questions and everybody gives you a bit or something or contradictory and you can't quite get to the bottom until finally somebody gives you the final piece of the evidence. And the question is, why did, did he kill himself or was he murdered? Now there was a, doc, a biography that looked up a story which two boys who had been playing in Auvergne in 1890 in 1950, they confessed to having messed around with a gun they borrowed because they thought they were cowboys and they think they had shot Van Gogh. Now, the whole agonizing story falls apart. These two boys just shot him. Very good shards of things because we think he was shot in the stomach. Now, if you want to kill yourself, everybody knows you shoot yourself in the head or you shoot yourself through the mouth. Right? Instant death, no pain. You can shoot yourself in your heart if you actually happen to know where it is and know how to avoid a rib. Right? Because that bounces off, okay? Reagan was shot in the lungs, if you remember, he survived. The Pope, if you go back, the, one of these many popes was shot in the stomach. Now that is really bad news because once you get a bullet in your gut, all that gunge, all that terrible stuff oozes out. So you are probably likely to die of an infection quite quickly unless somebody gets to you. Okay, so if it was the stomach, what are you doing with the gun shooting yourself in the guts? I mean, maybe you think, maybe the stomach's not the biggest, the real stomach is up here, but then you're going to run. So there's an enormous amount of forensic institute really working out what it is that happened, but this, this biography suggested that he had been shot, and this is the story that um, is going to take you through loving Vincent. But in the process of risk reconstructing, it reveals this question that I've been tracking, which is the transparency of Vincent van Gogh's paintings to a notion that they are really a story about a life and about a man, and that these paintings in Loving Vincent become transparent enough, and yet they are also still 
interestingly material, because you see all the, the backgrounds and the ways that he's painting. But for the backdrop, for the bits he didn't paint, they have to have grey screen sort of semi animation, in which the next question arises, that you see that he took two days to die between the 27th of July and midnight on, or 1 a.m. On, on the 20th, 30th effectively, he was left unmedicalized, no medical treatment. So as you watch the film, you think, why hasn't somebody called an ambulance? Why hasn't somebody taken him to Paris? So must be near, near enough you know, to Paris to get to a hospital. Why didn't a military surgeon attempt to remove the bullet at least? Now, of course, there are no antibiotics at the state. So, whatever. But just by creating that pause, you think not, you know, who killed him? Was it suicide or not? But why was he allowed to die? Now, Ad Eternity's Gate is an also a fascinating film to watch because it is absolutely in the spirit of um, the Outsider. It's absolutely in the spirit of Schnabel's earlier film, which was about Basquiat. He's interested in artists who come into the field untrained, but somehow burst upon the field. And I don't have time now because I'm running out of time. One of the key things that the film allows you to look at in a very long scene that is held in an asylum between Vincent van Gogh and a priest, which I recommend you look up and watch, is what is it to be a painter? Not what is it to be an artist, okay, which because we could define an artist as someone who submits themselves to a process by which their, their own sentiments and their own inner passions and purposes are subject, as you are in your training here, to having everything you thought you were good at shaken up, tipped out, re-examined, and put through a process to at least shape a creative potential in relation to both a wider and more extended and more challenging skill base, but also in relation to understanding where you are in the world. Yeah, that's what means, you know, bright people come into academies of art, you know, and you are put through something that makes a difference to your capacity to become an artist, to discover an economy in a practice that can generate and generate and generate again, that can simply do the same thing that you're good at. But these kinds of people, like uh, Basquiat and, and Van Gogh, are not artists in that sense, and that's why I mean he's an amateur, self-trained, autodidact. But he says in the film, I am a painter, and the priest says, does that mean you're born a painter? He says, yes, because that's the only thing I can do. Now, this isn't a mythic element. This is a very interesting insight into somebody for whom the nature of this activity is a different form of existential process. It is literally the affirmation at an ontological level that I exist each day in this particular exercise of materiality and an engagement with the world. So I wonder to myself, this is where I want to kind of come round it and try to get to a conclusion, that are these films, as it were, the millennial Vachor? Have we moved into something where these great myths that you might have been thinking, God, it's so boring going through all this about construction of the myth and the sacrificial and the mythic and the dead. You know, is this something we've done with? What is the Vachor for the present? Is, are these two films indicative of something which are the world, the world, and I, I don't mean it in any dismissive sense, but the world in which everybody is living in their own or other people's narratives, where we are narrating ourselves through every form of instant uh, tweet that you make or Instagram post that you make. There's a whole world now that we are all, um, as it were, caught up in a particular form of self-realization uh, that we've seen. Okay, And this leads us to the final question. Did Fahok kill himself? Do we have to deal with him in terms of suicide? Was he killed? They found the gun. Uh, in the 1960s, it re-emerged about 10 years ago, just sold for $180,000, so it's good to somebody who found it. We found out that he really did cut off his ear. There's the drawing that shows that he took a cutthroat razor. My father used to shave with a cutthroat razor, so I you know, know how sharp, you know, 
Um, I used to think it was an uh, epileptic fit he had and he just had sliced, but now we think it definitely was sliced off. But then the Van Gogh Museum, which is now the holder of the Van Gogh collection and the sustainer of the brand, year on year putting out yet more Van Gogh exhibitions, finding more things to sustain the merchandise that goes with it, they put on a show called On the Verge of Insanity, uh, Van Gogh and his illness. Now, have you ever seen a contradiction larger in life? Insanity is in the character of a certain discourse or myth that Foucault revealed to us about madness versus reason. Illness is a medical diagnosis. So was he mad or was he ill? So they had a conference and they got together all the psychiatrists who have now made a special study of Van Gogh's symptoms. There's about 15 of them. Professors of all sorts of kind all over. They got them all together, they closed them in a room and they said, you work it out. What was wrong with Van Gogh? Was he bipolar? Okay. Was he, did he suffer from mania? Did he have borderline uh, personality condition? Did he suffer from alcohol poisoning? Carbon monoxide poisoning, right? Uh, was he psychomotor epileptic? Uh, was he just disturbed because his mother had a baby called Vincent and he came along, so a psycho? They could not agree. They would not agree. They came out of their closed room, they presented to a public like us, and they all said, this is my case, this is definite, and various people from the audience added up. What about porphyry? There's a whole range of possible illnesses that could explain his symptoms. But they did, for the most part, um, not go with the sort of histoire de folie version, they went, for the most part, with the notion that he had mental health issues. And there is a very millennial moment. And the main conclusion is that it's probably bipolar disorder. Now, this is where it gets serious, but there's two things. So here, this is the, the, the screen grab from uh, a podcast, which the Tate Gallery, first exhibition at Tate Gallery since the 1947 one I mentioned, had this summer called For Hoch in Britain. I thought that must be an anti-Brexit exhibition, for sure. Really? Okay, let's stop it. But anyway, and they have challenging the myth of the torture genius, and they have a very nice and reasoned account to say that we generally think this poor man suffered from bipolar disorder. Now, bipolar disorder is extremely important, but typically, in a very millennial way, they have a little thing at the end saying, if you suffer from any of the issues that raised in this podcast, please go to the following help. Okay, please go to your resources page or join up with Mind. That I love that, etc. Now, I must end with this. Bipolar disorder is an extremely serious disorder. If any of you are interested, Kay Redfield Jamison is one of the world's experts. She is also a sufferer from it. She wrote this wonderful book called Touched by Fire, which is about all the poets and artists that she studied who seem to have the symptoms of bipolar disorder. And then she wrote her own account of what it was like for her as an 18 or 19 year old to begin to exhibit the symptoms. She gives some really interesting lectures. You can see her on YouTube because this is an affliction of young people. It most often occurs in late teen years, so it's very serious that we take it for young people and all institutions that deal with young people should be aware of this. It is hereditary. It means it passes in families, it's not because of anything that has happened to you, it is just a genetic problem, but it must be cared for. And she, her book is a wonderful one about how she hated the idea that she would have to take her medication because she would lose the exaltation that went, and the hypersexuality and the infinite energy that went with her mania, but she also would escape from the desperation of depression. And depression is not, in these cases, just being depressed. The speed with which it grabs you and it creates a form of such intense psychic pain that you want it to end. So suicidal thoughts are not, I think I want to kill myself in the drama that you will see in the story, but it is so unbearable that death and sleep, in a way, this I think is also, I work on Marilyn Monroe, another example of this, you don't want to die, you just want it to end. So it is possible that between painting those lovely pictures at the beginning of July and late July, someone with bipolar disorder could have switched from the manic energy which enabled him to paint the vast amount of paintings he painted while he was in Auvergne to a point at which he might have contemplated ending his life. But if we take it not through just mental health and some kind of 
um, culture of this, but actually to the intensity of the reality of a physical illness that afflicts you in this particular way and gives you the extraordinary ecstatic moments of exaltation which enabled him to paint so manically, but at the same time seems to have created in the 30s, aggravated by alcohol, a series of crises which get what's called rapid cycling, which you move between these two faster and faster, and particularly this form. So it is possible that Fahoch took his own life, but there is nothing in his art or his work that relates and leads to that death. What we should be doing with Vincent van Gogh is understanding something more complex, not that he was a great artist or that he wasn't an artist, but in, sense, in what sense did he understand what he was doing in relation to a compulsion to be a painter at a moment at which certain things were happening in art, but he was, I think as Minelli said, a Victorian, he did not understand what was happening, but at the same time he arrived at much the same position as most of his modernist colleagues, which was that in the face of capitalism, turned to painting. Thank you. <laughs>
you know, 30 years ago, is this, well, what, what is it for you now? Because the world is so full of anxiety. When I talk to my own fine arts students, you know, uh, it's eco-anxiety. It's the, the sense that this is impending catastrophe that is coming, you know, in the face of it. And I should just qualify what I said at the end, you know, that the retreat from being able to, to engage with modernity led to a kind of modernism of withdrawal. So what I keep trying to bring back, like René, is who's stuck with it? Who's tried to keep struggling with the nature of capitalist modernity and what it would be to produce an aesthetics of resistance? But at the same time, at the moment, we're seeing the, the, the play out of this, you know, that there is absolute sense of imminent catastrophe in the world. I mean, I know my children are thinking that they shouldn't have children, because who knows what world you should have children. You are going to grow up and be the artists and designers and graphic artists and filmmakers and all this, and I, I wonder, you know, you know, is your world preoccupied not with the kind of things that, you know, concern the 40s and 50s and 30s, the depression or, you know, post-World War, but it's catastrophic climate change, uncertain ecological political futures, we talk about democracy being threatened, we watch the rise of nationalism, ethnicities, xenophobia, you know, the inability for the world to think in a planetary way to absorb the needy people who have to leave countries where they cannot live without, for food or violence. You know, our political hopes are, are seem sort of shattered in certain kinds of ways. Do we have faith? Do we see the sort of impress of concentration is sneaking up? We have concentration camps in Britain. They call them deportation camps. You know, asylum seekers are being kept in them. And as I'm you know, on the verge of retirement, yeah, they can't, they haven't quite finished getting rid of me yet, I think they want me to go, but I wonder, you know, what this kind of exercise, as you say, of, of trying to see how um, myths and interpretations and arguments are so deep, you know, con related to not only the big political frame, which we can call the politics of a time, but actually what I'm interested in is cultural imaginary. Why do we still love this? Why do we desire these kinds of stories? Why are we bound to a sort of, a kind of a sacrificial vision of Van Gogh, or have we shifted that to now being a kind of um, sentimental you know, notion that we're all slightly ill, you know, and there's a certain way, and even if I went through that at the bipolar at the end, this is a kind of medicalization of subjectivity, but the question of political subjectivity, personal subjectivity, um, you know, is, is huge at the moment, and it is profoundly linked to this progressive um, involvement in moving image and media technology, right? So what I, the subtext of this lecture is the underlying sense of what can film if it's cinema, this critical practice with images, music, and sound, tell us about something, or what does it do to us? And now, what is the kind of, what is the Van Gogh for the moment that is itself um, self-sentimentalizing, self-narrating, you know, a world of like and unlike, and all of those elements of our cultural imaginary, which you can't imagine being outside of, and maybe you find people of my generation saying, well, oh, I was a bit nervous about this, just being, you know, old fogies, at least to get over it and get on with, you know, get yourself a Twitter account and join in. But, you know, um, we are in art and art history, the place where, you know, I think as, as you were saying in your lecture, we have to think, but I suppose in my lecture I'm saying you have to think and understand the unconscious, the fantasy, the, the mythic dimensions as to why you, quote, love something or desire something, now in a world of, of consumerism, so pervasive, you know, are you reading Naomi Klein? Are you reading Zygmunt Bauman? You know, uh, are you reading some of the kind of great writers of our present who are deeply concerned with what is happening and how can you critically use the media, whether it's architecture, space, design, graphics, film, or the fine arts, to correlate aesthetics and resistance. Uh, you know, a sort of, can aesthetics be a site of both political analysis and resistance? It's not just politics or history. It's really, and that's where I find the sort of trajectory of René just so interesting to, to look at. And, you know, I show my own students, Les Statues Meurs aussi, because it's so remote 
from the kinds of technologies that digitalization put at your fingertips, right? And everything that you have at your fingertips is a kind of mimesis of things that used to be physical or, you know, you can have all those effects. So how would you get a critical purchase on that? It seems to me that, that so, so the conversation I was trying to have really since is not just historiographical, but coming back so, uh, to what can we, I, say that might explore how I came to think about certain kinds of things, uh, be concerned with certain things. How does that then resonate as you face the questions about, you know, what you're going to do at the point at which I made this strange decision to write a 200,000 words dissertation on, um, you know, a Marxist analysis of Van Gogh in terms of memory, place, and um, industrialization. I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm silent for a moment because, in a way, um, even the process of asking the question, why is this? I, I have, um, I think what, what you do if you're a cultural an an analyst, analyst is you look for the symptoms. It's rather like, you know, it's a diagnostic rather than an expl I mean, I can't answer you why. Right? Because I don't think the nature of the social reality we live, or have lived ever since the beginning of um, capitalist modernity, has yielded. So the great argument about what happened in the 19th century is artists said, we have to be of our time, but what is this science of modernity? And so we have the kind of Baudelaire thing, we have rapidly their failure. They can't make signifiers and signified to produce an, a picture of modernity so that modernism becomes what I meant about you know, paint in the face of capitalism is it is opaque to it it's, you know, it's going to be very indirect etc and I think we are only now in the place of where I think you know you mentioned this in your lecture sort of you know when it talks about neoliberal rationality so I, I do find someone like Wendy Brown who's a great sort of American political theorist when she writes that it's a it's a rationality you know I can link that up with Sigmund Bauman's important work uh, on you know modernity in the Holocaust, which in the sense that there's a rationality in modernity, and rather like a sociologist, you look for the symptoms. So one of the reasons I mentioned Sigmund Bauman was the the sense of kind of listening for the oddity of the places where you will hear the the the, the elements that give you access. So conventional sociologists say you know Sigmund Bauman isn't a sociologist because he doesn't have any data. You know he doesn't systematically produce it and get us some statistics data. But he will say, I remember him saying this one thing about reading a newspaper report, not only was there a, you know, a rash of increase in cosmic, you know, cosmetic surgery, but that cosmetic surgeons offer you now a loyalty card. <laughs> and 
Well, I'm glad some of you got That's just an enormous deal. You're not just going to say, well, I, I just really hate my breasts, or I hate my nose. No, no, come back. We'll do your nose, and then we'll just sort out your shoulders. And then if you're not kind of happy with your bum, we'll do that one. I mean, what has happened to a sense of, you know, the integrity of your body? What, what is that symptomatic of? You should never, ever, ever, ever have an anesthetic if you can possibly avoid it. It is poisonous. Right? So the idea that you're voluntarily going to subject yourself and your body to the trauma of per perpetual surgical transformations on the grounds of what? I mean, this just opens up the hugeness of a kind of perversion of our understanding of bodies and people and that, that we're in, etc. And he just, he just snatched it out of a sort of a passing thing and a sort of a, a, a colour supplement of a newspaper that's very old, but it's in that kind of way. And I think that's the thing that we do in a way that you can provide a close reading. Now, I needed another two hours to show you the films and go through that, etc. Because it's going back to this close reading of what it is that enables us to at least be picking up, and that's what we did in concentration memories. We took, you know, 30 minutes of film and said, it will take you 18 months to see it, to understand what it's doing formally as a means by which it's producing a certain kind of um, understanding through the aesthetic and also resistance to the what it's trying to understand uh, in terms of the concentrationary. So I see our role is always slightly behind. We're like the crows. We come after the plow, right? So we're picking up the bits and looking carefully at the seeds. And in terms of 1989, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I do not feel that art history has grasped, I don't think art history grasped what the Holocaust did to art history. The rupture of an entire possibility of how bodies and landscapes could ever be the same, you can't have a Raphael, you can't have a Three Graces anymore, you can't have, you know, a Giorgione landscape with a body lying in the fields when you've seen bodies lying in the Ukraine about to be shot. The, the, the trauma of what really happened has not changed art history, which tells the story of the 20th century without that rupture. I think the same is true of 1989. So I turn to the anthropologists or the sociologists who are saying, right, this is something we need to work out what it was, right? Now, the post-colonial thinkers see this moment as mass migration, mass media communication, and I've forgotten the third thing that uh, Apadurai argues, commun communication, migration, and media. Yeah, anyway. You know, I think there are people picking up on these transformations, but I don't think this until the full degree of, I think you were also talking about some, kind of the complicity with the Cold War system and the indifference to the fate of those who lived through it is, is taken up. So what I said at the very beginning about reading the novels, understanding the societies, studying the artists who lived through it and speaking it back to you know, West Europeans and, 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 and you know, other Anglophones that I speak to, I, I mean, I speak in French too, to the French as well, uh, is important, but what it is that has happened collided with the victory of a certain kind of globalizing capitalism. And now I think we're, we're seeing what that impact is of, there's no alternative. And the alternative is therefore being generated inside the aggravated and menaced democracies, right? And so this notion that, you know, we might, you know, democracy isn't just, oh, everybody's democratic now. It is now the internal contradictions. So if you want, you know, if you look at something, I have to mention it, Brexit, I mean, this is not, you know, this is nothing to do with pro or anti-European. It's entirely to do with the desolation of austerity, the violence done to people, and the indifference. And one of the art historians who didn't teach me, Anthony Blunt, who became a Soviet spy which, um, in, in Britain, he did it because he witnessed the depression, and he could not bear the moral ugliness of the English ruling classes in their indifference to men and women who walked 
you know, from the north of England through England to say we are starving without any shoes and they were indifferent to their plight and it's that which turned that generation to sort of abs absorb something which we then discovered was the, s the source of you know in, in unspeakable horror in the 20th century so I, I think this this question of our um, role in agitating being vigilant and creating the kinds of affective responses that are not the affective consumerist culture of this absolutely pacifying um, world that we live in. The only good thing about climate change, I am told confidently by people who know, is that life at its best for those countries that survive it will return to the 1980s. Fashion-wise, this will be a disaster, <laughs> but you will not have digital culture at all. There will be no phones and no computers, because the lithium will be gone. <laughs> I'll just hang out for that now. Thank you for being here.